Good morning. Um, this is a recording of a presentation given at the LCNAU Colloquium in Paris at UWA in November 2019. The title is Is Fear in Your Heart and Love in Your Throat? Linguistic Variation and Cultural Diversity in Australian Emotion Metaphors. And the authors are myself, Maya Ponsonnet, a senior lecturer at UWA, and uh, Kitty Jean Lajinia. So this is um, a presentation that will discuss body-based emotion metaphors. Um, and when I say metaphors here, I mean tropes. And this label includes metaphors and metonymies for those who are technically inclined in, in these uh, labels. So I will be using metaphors in a general sense. And body-based emotion metaphors are things like broken hearted in English. So you have an expression that describes, literally describes a state of your body, of your heart specifically, but in fact, what it means is a, an emotional state, namely to be sad. And uh, Australian languages have a lot of these metaphors, uh, of these expressions with the, belly, with the body. Sorry. So for instance, in uh, Talamari Nanam land, there's an expression that means to be belly flows, to feel good. In Aranda, in Central Australia, you have throat is burning for feel angry. Ghana, in South Australia, liver staggering to mourn, and you name it. There's uh, hundreds and hundreds of those with very diverse um, metaphors. This is not unusual. That sort of metaphors are frequent across the world, as we see from English, perhaps even universal. But uh, like I suggested, they are particularly frequent in Australian languages. And this paper presents the first continent-wide study of this phenomenon based on a sample of 67 languages across Australia um, from published and unpublished sources. Um, and what we found across this sample is that these body-based emotional tropes are attested in 53 languages. And it doesn't mean that they're actually absent in the rest. It means that they are not, they haven't been documented or attested in the, in the other languages, but they may be there. And in just these 67 languages, we found more than 800 um, expressions um, with the body related to emotions, and more than 30 body parts were involved. I'm not going to be able to do justice to the data in this presentation because each, maybe not each, but a lot of these 800 expressions would deserve a whole presentation of itself, for itself. Um, but I'm going to um, yeah, present a general picture in 20 minutes or so. Um, and I would like to point out that for those who want to know more, there's um, a web page in preparation where more of the data will be explained. So this presentation is a synthesis that presents first the major body parts and what they mean. And then I'll discuss emer emergent scenarios. So suggestions and hypotheses as to how did these connections be between the body, specific body parts and emotions, how did that happen? And finally, I present um, a number of profiles of major body parts um, that have some specific semantic and figurative characteristics. The major body parts, uh, like I said, we found more than 30 in total, uh, but the stomach or belly is by far the most frequent. Um, <coughs> it occurs in 26 languages out of 67, which is more than two thirds and across the whole continent. Um, and just in itse of itself, the belly uh, covers 275 expressions of uh, these 800s. I would like to mention here that, of course, it's not the case that in every language in the world there's a term that translates well as, you know, stomach or belly, because, you know, terms for body parts can vary in their extension. So, for instance, a, a language may have a word for um, hand uh, and another word for fingers, whereas some other languages may have a single word that covers both. Um, so here we have, of course, taken into account these, these various interpretations as the best as we could. And uh, this is also informed by my background um, where I have carried out a, an in-depth study of this sort of body-based expressions for emotions in the Taliban language, which is an Australian language. So in a sense, the, the interpretation we present here is informed by this uh, study that I've carried out in the past. 
And it's the same with the labels we use for emotions. They are, of course, emotions are partly culturally specific and uh, the interpretation of the data takes into account um, the, the sort of uh, emotional meanings and units we find in Australian languages. So the belly is the most frequent. Now, other frequent body parts, the ones that have more than 25 tokens in our data, um, there's uh, mostly two thoughts. The one is abdominal organs, such as the heart or uh, the liver, um, and also parts of the torso, the abdomen, the chest, but also parts of the head or parts of the face. So these are the eyes, the nose, the head itself, the face, the ears, um, and the forehead. And then there's also the throat, which is a bit unique, a bit of an art layer, and we'll talk about that. And then there's nearly 20 other uh, miscellaneous body parts, very diverse, um, including systemic body parts like the body, the skin, the flesh. There's nothing very, very surprising in terms of the body parts that uh, occur. Um, one thing that perhaps is not notable is that the limbs are quite rare. They're not very productive in terms of um, emotion metaphors. Now, of course, as one would expect, different body parts denote different emotions, and that's because they are connected to emotions for different reasons. So what are these reasons, and how did these connections happen? That's what I'm going to talk about now in the second part of this uh, presentation about emergence scenarios for these body-based expressions. So how did these body parts become associated with emotions? And also there's another question behind it, which is, how does it, uh, does it tell us anything about how speakers construe emotions, and if so, what? Um, and does it tell us something about individual cultures, or does it perhaps tell us about human beings more generally and how they construe emotions? A caveat here is that most languages in the world, like I said, associate body parts with emotions. So it's not the case that it's a specific Australian feature, for instance, yet it's true that Australian languages do it a lot. And it's interesting to know that there may be some of the associations, some of the associations may be culturally specific, but also some of them are clearly not. And a good example here is the uh, metaphor anger is heat, which has been um, claimed to be universal or quasi-universal. And indeed, in Australian languages, with respect to body parts, it's all over the place and we find it with most body parts, in fact. So here an example from Aranda is a uh, hot head uh, for to be irritated or angry. So that's, of course, not telling us anything about Australian langu languages and cultures in particular. Another caveat when we discuss uh, the, the history and the reasons of these associations between body parts and emotions is that the history of each association is very intricate. Um, there's um, very often there's, there's time death, so there's um, different historical layers uh, of, uh, with different reasons for the association. There's also language com contact that comes into the picture. So it's very uh, complex and, ha and difficult to disentangle. We are working on it, but at this, this point we cannot give hard and fast answers. What we can do, however, is highlight a few plausible emergence scenarios which I will do now, and these are the scenarios that are supported by our data, which are plausible given what we see in the data. One scenario, um, as expected, is that body parts associate with emotions in language, linguistically, when they associate with emotions in real life. But then there's a number of possible pathways for this to happen, and it's interesting to distinguish. So one way is via what I call somatic bridges. So somatic um, bridges are when there's a physical or physiological state of an emotional state that associates with the emotion. So if you take um, this Talbot expression, it means belly stuck, and it also means, well, literally it's belly stuck, and what it really means is to feel anxious. And of course, you may know from experience that anxiety often comes together with a, a tight belly. So there's um, a coincidence in real life between the emotional state and the physical state of the body part, the physiological or somatic state of the body part, and this can then channel the linguistic association. 
A second type of bridge is the same principle, but, but with behavior. So behavioral bridges, and it's the same mechanism, except that it's a behavior that associates with the emotional state. So here we, you have an expression that means to follow from the eyes, and uh, that's the literal meaning, and what it means in fact is to covet. And of course, you can imagine that someone who wants something might watch it carefully. So that's another possibility which is also attested in the data. And a third possibility is an indirect association via intellection. So an example here is this word free expression, which means uh, ears tick out, which obviously doesn't really mean much, but um, it actually means to keep thinking. And this is because in many Australian languages, the ear is uh, treated as the seat of the intellect, of uh, intellection. So it's quite natural to have an expression meaning ears tick out, which actually means keep thinking. And then this intellectual process of thinking is associated with an emotion in real life, if you like, because of course, if you keep thinking, often you're going to be a bit obsessive and to worry. So this expression also means uh, to obsess and to or to worry, and this is because of a coincidence between an intellectual process and an emotional state in real life. So all these three types of association of bridges do tell us something about what aspects of emotions are salient for speakers, because. In, one has to hypothesize that in order for a particular aspect of a body part to become linguistically associated, to become the linguistic symbol of an emotion, this uh, state, this particular state of the body part would be salient uh, in the emotional state in question. However, there is another type of association, um, which is via semantic shift. Uh, so when word, uh, words shift take go from one meaning to another. We know from previous studies that the meaning of body part words is very versatile. So um, you may, you know, in a language you may have a, a word that means um, hand for a while and it can quickly shift to meaning uh, arm, for instance, just by extension. Um, so if we return to our question of emotion metaphors, um, we can consider this expression in Cadiz from Central Australia where um, aleme the, means belly, and this expression uh, means stomach speak, or stomach rumbling from something you ate, um, and that actually means to feel worried or anxious or jealous, so that's a quite um, expected digestive metaphor for the belly, as we already saw. So that's for Kadij, where we see a classic uh, belly-based expression, if you like. Now, if we look at Ayawara, which is a, another neighboring language of Central Australia, the same root actually primarily means liver. And it also occurs in emotional uh, tropes, such as liver get hard for, get angry, for instance. And here, a very, very plausible hypothesis, also given the rest of the data, is that this metaphor, this expression, was probably formed when the word Alama meant belly in Aliawara, like it does in Kairij in the present. And then this word shifted to mean liver uh, in, in Aliawara, which created an association between the liver and emotions. And note that this sort of process does not, does not tell us anything about how speakers perceive emotion. It's a sort of linguistic accident, if you like. So we have at least, based on our data, um, two different types of scenarios with subtypes. So there's association in real life, which can be somatic, behavioral, or via intellection. And then there's association via semantic shift. And of course, this is just uh, what, these are just the, the situations where the, the original association between an emotion and a body part can occur, but from there, many more expressions can emerge by conceptual derivation, so it gets creative. You can have flowing belly, heart stands, green liver, you name it. And the scenarios in question, these different scenarios that I've highlighted, they, they can also combine. So for a single body part in a single language, you may find different ways in which it associates with emotions. So it's not just, you know, monolithic. 
Yet, there are trends and profiles. So some body parts that seem to be doing more one thing or another. And that's what I'm going to talk about now, discussing the figurative profiles of different types of body parts. The first type is internal body parts with prevalent somatic bridges. So this is the body parts where in our data, somatic bridge expressions are actually attested. And that concerns two abdominal organs, the belly on, or, and the heart, as well as the throat. And note that all these are invisible body parts, body parts you cannot see. And that makes sense because these somatic bridges, they refer to sensations and therefore um, they can apply to body parts that people don't see, but that one feels. Um, the belly we have already seen can associate with emotions via digestive tropes. Um, and semantically, of course, semantically, it's very broad because the belly has like 275 expressions just in our data and it covers most emotions. But one salient uh, type of expressions is for generic emotions such as feel good or feel bad. So it's kind of, you know, neutral. Um, and also there's ex emotions oriented towards others. When you feel angry or love or compassion or grief, all these other oriented uh, expressions. The heart is different. The heart is semantically a bit more focused. Um, so on love and fear on the one hand and anger on the other hand. And in terms of uh, somatic bridges, we find heartbeat tropes. So you can have expressions meaning heartbeat, which means, for instance, here, feel bad or worry. So this is about, you know, anxiety and fear and the fact that your heart beats faster in these situations. The throat is also quite specific semantically. Um, it specializes for desire and love and it's it's much more sexually oriented than the heart for instance and this this semantics uh, desire and love is dominant in central australia whereas in western australia we find anger and the the split between these two semantic foci is quite clear in fact the throat is a bit uh, different from other body parts because it's a lot more uh, crisp in its distribution first it's doesn't appear in the north of the continent, practically not. Um, and also there, there's like the semantics, like I said, is very focused. And this could be because it's more recent. Recent, um, We don't really know. In terms of trope, we find dryness tropes, things like, you know, dry throat for angry or also burning throat. And this could have to do with the arid climate and this could be culturally specific. And indeed, the throat is probably, you know, compared to the belly or the heart, it's not a body part that we find, you know, overwhelmingly find in association with emotions across the world's languages. So it could be a specificity of some um, drier parts of Australia. Here, of course, I would like to emphasize that I'm only uh, highlighting the bridges. I'm not talking about all the expressions that uh, you know, all have a different sort of figurative dimension. Another type of body parts profile, if you like, is the are the ones with uh, where semantic shift plays a strong role, and we have already seen uh, the case of the liver. And in the data, it's also interesting that another argument in favor of this role of semantic shift is that we haven't found any somatic bridge with the liver within the liver's set of expressions, and. Also, the semantics compares with the semantics of belly-based expressions. So it's easy to imagine that the, the expressions that currently feature the liver, in fact, many of them used to feature the belly. Another uh, two body parts where semantic shift seems to play a relatively strong role are parts of the torso, the abdomen and the chest. And we know uh, that, especially in the domain of uh, body parts, extensions from a smaller part to a larger whole are common. So it's not at all surprising that the belly, that terms for belly could extend to mean the, the abdomen or the chest or same with the heart. And indeed it's attested in our data. And again, uh, the semantics combine that of the belly and the heart. And again, we don't find very clear somatic uh, bridges or any sort of bridges in our data. A third type now are visible body parts with behavioral bridges. And these are parts of the face, the eyes and the nose. And this is logical because you can think of these, you can 
if you think that these body parts are extremely visible and socially salient in you know, interpersonal communication, it makes sense that people exploit uh, behavioral bridges to connect them with emotions. So with the eyes, we have already seen um, the, the association between follow from the eyes and covet, which is a behavioral association with desire, jealousy, love. So like the throat, the eyes are quite um, sexually oriented. But there's also associations with fear and surprise. With fear, um, there's the, 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 one of the bridges is to, to stare for being brave. So looking at something intensely means that you're not afraid of it. And these two sort of bridges, types of bridges, match cultural codes relative, relative to eye contacts in Australian, amongst Australian groups. But there's also an association with surprise, with uh, eyes become big. And, you know, of course, this is evocative of responses, behavioral responses to surprise, visible responses. The nose uh, connects with emotions we, via the bridge of turning your nose, so turning your nose up or sideways for, you know, when you don't like something. And uh, this is very social as well. So it connects with emotions such as being angry or sulky or social dispositions to being selfish, stubborn, greedy, that sort of things. There's a lot of expressions for big nose meaning for selfish or, or uh, distant, etc. Finally, there's a, a fourth type of body parts where association is via intellection, and these are the ear, the head, and the forehead. So we saw that the ear is often treated as a seat of intellection in Australian languages, and of course, head and forehead can do that too, which is the case in many languages. And then intellection connects with emotions. And the way this happens in Australian languages is often that intelligence is associated with social awareness and appropriateness. So yeah, there's a lot of expressions for compliance where something to mean listen also means to obey, for instance. On this basis, these body parts express a lot of attitudinal social emotions, compliance, ag agreeableness, uh, being stubborn, irresponsible, selfish, um, etc. And the head also connects with shame quite clearly, quite strongly. And shame is, uh, you know, also very uh, clearly associated with social awareness, in, especially in Australian cultures. And then the ear has a few other links to more specific emotion having to do with specific uh, intellectual processes, such as confusion, obsession, anxiety, as we have seen the, the link for, with thinking for worrying, which is quite widespread. In fact, independent of body parts, it's quite widespread in Australian languages, and that could also perhaps be, be uh, culturally specific. So some conclusions. As we would expect, body-based associate with emotions based on certain principles. We can distinguish between internal invisible body parts that often rely on somatic bridges and also some abdominal organs and parts of the torso that associate via semantic shift and in a sense follow from internal invisible body parts. And semantically, these tend to focus on anger, fear, love and compassion. Um, and also others, but these are the main ones. And then there are some visible body parts, especially parts of the face, that rely on behavioral bridges, as well as also visible body parts around the head that associate by intellection. And all these visible body parts tend to associate with social and attitudinal emotions, not only, but that's one of the main things. And of course, for all these observations, we can ask, are these principles universal? Uh, is this distribution a feature of Australian languages specifically, or does it also apply in other uh, continent or language families? And this can only be answered uh, via future research, which would carry out similar studies in, on different continents to see if we find the same patterns. And like I said, sorry I could not spend much time on the individual expressions. Um, I had to you know, be limited by time, but more is coming up on this web page.